All right, let's take a look here at example number five to see how we can use this idea of Green's theorem generalizing to regions with holes. All right, so suppose that C1 is the unit circle with a counterclockwise orientation. Suppose that C2 is a circle centered at the origin with radius two and also has a counterclockwise orientation. And let C be the positively oriented curve that's given by the union of these two curves. Specifically though, C2 unioned with negative C1. Okay, so let's see. Sketch a picture of C, the curve, and the region that it encloses. Okay, so this actually isn't too terrible. Let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and make a nice uh, xy axis. Okay, here we are. And then I'm going to go ahead and start to create some circles. So maybe here I have a nice uh, unit circle sitting right there. Okay, And I'm going to create another circle that's a little bit bigger. Uh, this is a circle that's going to kind of enclose it. So let's see. Maybe again, uh, I have that this is a circle up here with radius 2, and this is my unit circle on the inside with radius 1. So I can see that the region that's enclosed by this curve, these curves is going to be this space. Right? It's this donut shape that we have in here. So there's my region that's enclosed. Okay, And uh, I can see that if C1 is supposed to be the unit circle, and the unit circle had counterclockwise orientation that then got reversed, I'm going to have to have clockwise orientation. So let's see, that would be going this way. Okay, Clockwise orientation, this here is negative C1. C2 was the circle of radius 2 and it had counterclockwise orientation. So I'll put that in the picture. It's moving like this. So what I might note here right away is that when I consider the curve C that's defined by both of these curves put together, that if I move around C2, is C2 positively oriented? Well, yeah, because when I reach out to the left, I actually touch the green space. Is C1 positively oriented? Yeah, because when I reach out, I touch the green space. So I can say, note, C negative C1 and C2 are positively oriented, so C is positively oriented. Okay, so there's my region. It's pretty nice. Now let's suppose that I wanted to compute then this work integral. And here's the vector field that I'm working with. It's a pretty messy one. But I might notice some things right away. So I'll start by saying this. We note that F has continuous first order partials everywhere in R2 uh, except the origin. Notice that if I was to take derivatives of either of these two uh, pieces here with respect to x or with respect to y, I'm going to have to use the quotient rule. And the denominator is just going to contain an x squared plus a y squared just all to a second power. So as long as x and y are not both zero, everything here should be fine. However, I can see here that since the origin is not enclosed by C. Notice C only enclosed the green space. So since this is not enclosed by C, we know that the generalization of Green's theorem will apply. So, my integral f dot dr across c, I know I can immediately trade out for this double integral over d of my partial of q with respect to x minus my partial of p with respect to y 
And if I wanted to go ahead and actually crunch this out, uh, I'd have to take those partials. I'm going to go ahead and do it here just to show fully how to run this through. So if I start taking a look at Q, remember here that uh, my Q is going to be the piece that gets multiplied to my uh, to my dx. So when I start to take its derivative, notice that I'm going to ultimately end up with, let's see, my denominator is going to look like x squared plus y squared, quantity squared. I'm going to have an x squared plus a y squared. If I'm taking the derivative with respect to x, and again, keep in mind, this over here is my p, this over here is my q, then when I take the derivative, uh, so I'm setting up my quotient rule, I have left the denominator alone for this fraction, I've then placed it back on top, then I'm going to have a times 1, and then I'm going to minus and reverse the order. I'm going to leave the x, and I'm going to take the derivative um, with respect to x of the denominator, and that's going to get me 2x. So I get this, then I subtract, and I do my quotient rule. Now with respect to y on the p function. So again, I'm going to have an x squared plus a y squared. I'm going to take the derivative of y with negative y with respect to y, and I'm going to get negative 1. And then I'm going to reverse the order. I'm going to leave my negative y, and I'm going to take the derivative of the denominator with respect to y, which is going to get me 2y. Okay, So I have all of this dA. And what I'll notice is that if I try to simplify this down, some interesting things here are going to happen. Um, well, let's see, what do I end up with ultimately in the numerator? I have the same denominator here, so I can kind of combine some of these things. See, my big fraction is ultimately going to have, let's see, I have a negative x squared on the first plus a y squared. That's what I have in the first numerator. In the second one over here, I'm going to have to subtract and think about what I have left. So I'm going to have a negative x squared, and I'm going to have a Is that going to be I'm going to have a negative x squared, and I'm going to have a negative Wait a minute. Something's off here. I'm experiencing a slight problem. <laughs> Let me quickly see what I did here. Oh, obviously, uh, this here is supposed to be a subtraction, right? Because I'm doing quotient rule. So I'm going to have this, and then my uh, I'm going to end up with a, is that going to be a positive y squared up there? I'm going to get negative 2y squareds, positive 2y squareds, and a negative y squared. So I'm going to be left with a positive one. And then I'm going to have an x squared plus a y squared, all squared. There we go. Of course, if I simplify this all the way down, in my numerator, I'm going to realize, oh, uh, everything's going to cancel out, right? I'm going to have a negative x squared, a positive x squared. I'm going to get a negative y squared when I distribute that negative in here. So that's going to cancel out with that. And I'm ultimately just going to have zero. And so this whole thing turns into zero. So having the ability to use Green's theorem again is really extremely helpful because otherwise, Instead of doing this work, which realistically isn't that much, I might have had to instead find a parameterization for each of these curves and compute two different integrals using this horrible vector field. That would have been really, really messy. So Green's theorem is really, really a, a powerful idea that can allow us to shortcut a lot of work as it relates to line integrals.